Hello, I'm Monsignor Jim Lasanti. Today, on Personally Speaking, I'll be joined by Bishop James Conley from Lincoln, Nebraska. Bishop Conley announced recently to his diocese with great joy that he has returned from his medical leave of absence. Please stay with us. Welcome to Personally Speaking. I'm your host, Monsignor Jim Lasanti, and Bishop James Conley from the Diocese of Lincoln, Nebraska, joins me now. In December of 2019, Bishop Conley received permission from Pope Francis to take an 11-month medical leave of absence from his ministry. That month, Bishop Conley was diagnosed with depression and anxiety, along with chronic insomnia and debilitating tinnitus. In announcing his leave of absence, Bishop Conley said he was sharing his information about his health in hopes of helping to lift the stigma associated with mental health issues. Bishop Conley was ordained a priest for the Diocese of Wichita in 1985. He has served as Bishop of the Diocese of Lincoln since 2012. Bishop Conley has been auxiliary bishop in the Archdiocese of Denver since 2008 and had worked in the Vatican's Congregation for Bishops from 1996 to 2006. Bishop Conley says that he hopes his own sufferings will encourage others who struggle with mental illness and show that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Joining me now, I'm very pleased to welcome to Personally Speaking, an old friend, we were pro-life directors together many years ago, Bishop James Conley of the Diocese of Lincoln, Nebraska. Welcome, Bishop Conley, on our show. And uh, I'm going to start on a a topic that uh, I'm big into family of origin. You know that uh, we are very much the people who planted good seed in us. So could you start by telling us, Bishop, Betty and Carl, what did they do right in raising you? <laughs> well, uh, the, uh, you know, my mother just passed away. I don't uh, know if you knew that. Uh, on, on December 19th at 92. Oh, God bless um, you. So she, she, uh, she tested positive for COVID and then it was kind of related to that, but she had a long life and uh, a good life. Um, but uh, God rest her soul. I don't think I, I had mentioned that to you. Yeah. Um, but they, uh, my mom and dad, uh, my dad died in 2006, um, raised me. Basically, we were kind of nominally Christian. We didn't really have a, a faith uh, that we, a church that we went to the on a regular basis, uh, maybe on Christmas, maybe on Easter. But they, they raised raised us, myself and my sister, with very strong Christian values. And my father was a veteran of the Second World War, mm-hmm. came out of that great generation. Um, and I guess if you say what was the philosophy of life that he instilled and inculcated into us was the fact that, uh, you know, that you can uh, sort of rugged individualism. You can do, you can fix anything. If you work hard enough, you can do anything. You, uh, you know, you kind of pull yourself up by your bootstraps Mm-hmm. And a lot of self-reliance and uh, self-determination. And you can uh, do whatever you want to do. So I kind of was a product of that right. philosophy of life, you know. And it was good in a lot of ways. But then in a lot of ways, uh, you know, it wasn't so good. Because, uh, you know, we're not our own captains, you know. And things right. happen. And we're out of our control. And uh, we can't fix everything. Yeah. Okay. So they gave you some strength. But at the same time, not necessarily the idea that we are interdependent people and we need sometimes to reach out for help. Now, uh, Bishop Conley, when you and I knew each other back in our 30s, uh, I remember one of my bishops then developed some serious illness. And uh, those of us who were part of his staff were strongly encouraged never to say anything in public about it. You know that the bishop was sick, but no one was to know that. Uh, You've kind of turned that model upside down by being completely transparent about the challenges you faced what went into your decision to say, uh, I'm not going to hide this from my people. What I am, I am by the grace of God. Let me share it with others. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, it kind of, it, it, it came on um, slowly and I didn't, uh, I didn't realize that I was being kind of uh, ground down. You might say um, I wasn't sleeping. And uh, I, this was back, if you trace it back to the beginning, I guess it started in, in August of, of 2018 
And it really wasn't until March of, of 2019 that I finally went to, um, to a doctor. You know, I went to the Mayo Clinic to get checked out. I said, something's not right. I'm not sleeping. Uh, I'm uh, worn out. Um, and so uh, up to that time, I you know, just kind of soldiered forth. I can get, I can get through this. I can get through this. You know, it's just work harder. You know, you're just, just not, you're just, you're not work hard enough. And so, um, when I went to the Mayo Clinic and they diagnosed me as, uh, you know, I had, had suffered from anxiety and depression. Mm-hmm. Also this tinnitus, which is this, this, or tinnitus, you call it what, two different ways of calling it, the, this ringing in my ear and insomnia, which is, you know, not sleeping. And, um, so that was in May of 2019. And um, I still didn't really tell anybody except for my closest, uh, you know, staff that, you know, that I'm struggling with some these things, but didn't really make, make it public. But it wasn't getting any better. And in fact, it was getting worse. And finally, I decided in that fall, would be fall of 2019, that I, I, I'm going to have to get some help. And I approached the, a couple of my very close bishop friends, um, Archbishop Coakley, who you probably remember, um, who's the Archbishop of Oklahoma City, uh, is my longest, best friend. If we go back to uh, seventh grade when we played on the same baseball <laughs> team. So, uh, and then Bishop Olmsted, who was my former bishop uh, mm-hmm. in, uh, in Wichita. He's down in Phoenix now. And Bishop Jim Wall, who uh, was key to the whole thing. And I told them, and, and they said, well, you know, you ought to maybe take some time off and, and really address this uh, because you're not getting any better. And we see that you're getting worse. You know, and you know, when your friends tell you that, you know, you know that uh, they're, they're seeing something. And so at the November U.S. bishops meeting, I approached the Apostolic Nuncio. That was in 2019. And he was wonderful, Archbishop Pierre. And I, and I told him the whole situation. And it's the first time I'd ever talked to him about this. And, and he said, well, you need some rest. You need to take some time off. And um, so um, I said, how do I do that? <laughs> I'm a bishop. And he said, yeah. well, just write me a letter. And, uh, the, and then also the Metropolitan Archbishop Lucas, who is the Archbishop of Omaha, my neighbor to the east, um, he suggested that he could take over while I was gone as apostolic administrator. So I wrote up the letter. And um, when I got back from the meeting in Baltimore and uh, it had to go to the Pope, and it came back and said, yeah, take some time off. Take, take uh, how much ever time you, you have off. And, and I, asked, I asked the nuncio, I said, should I just tell them why? And he said, yeah, sure, just tell them why. Mm-hmm. And so that's when I decided just why, you know, this day and age, you know, a bishop leaves and all kinds of things people will think. And so I decided just to be absolutely 100% honest, you know. Yeah. And so I went through the whole thing and told him this is what happened. And, 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 you know, and the response was remarkable. I mean, the, both my priests, all my priests, but also the lay faithful, um, you know, said, take as much time as you need, Bishop. Um, you know, thank you for being so honest with us. Yeah. We'll be praying for you. We'll be praying for you. And, um, and I got a lot of letters from people who said, you know, my son went through the same thing or you know mm-hmm. uh, i've struggled with depression in my own life you know my husband has this thing. so uh, you know almost it seems like almost every family has been touched by uh, anxiety or depression then you know i take this medical leave of absence the 13th of december of last year 2019 and then you know in february of 2020 the whole world takes a medical leave of absence mm-hmm. when the covid hits right you right know? and and that that was strange. I mean, I didn't know what none of us saw that coming. And, um, for me, it was, it was, wasn't helpful because I was just kind of starting to kind of get a routine going and all of a sudden everything locks down, you know, you got to be isolated and isolation is one of the worst things, you know, for depression. You don't want to be isolated. Right. And Bishop, so, Bishop, let me, let me, let me uh, ask you this. Do you think, and this is so hard to speculate, but are they, the burdens that, that caused you to be, uh, depressed, uh, overwhelmed. If you, uh, if you had stayed in Wichita as a pastor of a nice parish, do you suspect you'd be suffering the same thing as you do in the unique role of a bishop? Oh, that's a good question. I, uh, you know, I, I, I often think about, uh, you know, back in, in uh, when things were simpler. 
uh, being pastor of uh, a parish and uh, there's different kinds of pressures, but not the kind of pressures that bishops have today, I think. Yeah. So who knows what would have happened? I don't know. Um, right, but right. I do, you know, I, I do know that it was, life was much simpler then. Yes. And um, the complexities, the tensions, the pressures of being a bishop today mm. um, is, is, is a lot different than being a pastor of a parish. You know, I was uh, recently with a bishop who posed for 400 parishioners to uh, get a picture with the bishop. And I said, you're a very patient man to put up with it. And he said, uh, if you find people out there who are still supporting bishops and the church, you want to you wanna work with them. Uh, your own people, uh, you find, have been though wonderfully supportive, and that's a great thing. I, I listen. I listened to all your um, definitions of the things you were suffering from: depression, insomnia, and I realized, God, I've got some of those too, you know. But I, I realized mine is related to uh, I, I'm responsible for my hundred year old mother, and uh, and she wakes up about three times a night. So if she wakes up, I wake up. And I thought oh, to myself, wow. good for you. Good for you. <laughs> She's a part of that yeah. greatest generation too. But sleep is essential, yeah. and a lot of us it are is distracted, and we we don't. Are you sleeping better now? I am. I'm sleeping much much better. And it, we we I underestimated the importance of sleep. I didn't think I needed yeah. sleep. You know, I was still thinking with a college kid's mind. You know, don't need much sleep. Uh, burn the candle at both ends. Those kind of things. And you, it's, it's absolutely essential. You really need that. Bishop, there's a, a sign outside a hospital in New York that's always struck me. It says that uh, uh, depression is not a moral failure. It's a, a true illness. Um, do you find, as I still do, I'm afraid, that some people see it as some kind of human weakness or moral failing, don't realize it's as real as any other illness? Right, right. No, I, I, I think that's true. There's a stigma that's still attached to it, and people don't look at depression as they would, uh, let's say, diabetes or um, you know, any other kind of physical uh, illness that uh, is so common. In fact, it, I'm sure, you know, I don't know, depression is probably as common as diabetes. It's, just, it's, yeah. it's everywhere. And even uh, the, you know, like, let's say the corporate world um, doesn't understand it. I'm sure that if, you know, a businesswoman or a businessman you know, says, I want time off for uh, dealing with depression. It might be kind of hard. They might lose their job. Yeah. Not considered, you know, it's not considered a, a real illness, but it is. It's, it's a real illness like anything else. There's a, a favorite movie of mine, probably yours too, is It's a Wonderful Life. And I love that at the beginning of the film, uh, when Clarence is brought forth to St. Joseph and St. Peter, what's his problem? Is he sick, George Bailey? Uh, worse than that, he's, he's discouraged. How did you get back from discouragement? What are the steps? Is it, is it therapy? Is it medicine? Uh, what's the road back, Bishop? Because you've taken that road. Can you share with us, is there a right way to get away from discouragement and into a spirit of hope again? Yeah, well, it's all those you mentioned. Uh, when I was down in Phoenix, it's where I spent most of the time. Um, I, had, uh, I had a good doctor um, and psychiatrist who, you know, there was medications involved, which helped. Uh, that wasn't the answer. Right. But also I had a good psychotherapist, a good Catholic psychotherapist who was um, really, really helpful and encouraging and uh, helped me kind of think through things in a much uh, healthier way. And then I had a spiritual director, a um, great priest, a younger priest, you know, 20 years younger than I am. I was a little bit kind of wondering how this would go, <laughs> but it was, he was great. He was great. And um, so those three, those three things really, really helped a lot. And then I had... I have to say um, there was a family that um, I, they were students of mine when I was the chaplain at the University of Dallas in Rome. And they had since gotten married and have five kids. The oldest is going off to, went off to college this fall. I spent, especially during the lockdown, I spent like probably against the law, but I spent uh, three, three nights a week over there eating with the family and um, just being with a, a real family, you know, and five kids. And it's just, it was just such a, a wonderful human thing. Um, so it was a combination of all those things. It wasn't just one thing, um, but it was also um, not giving up. I think yeah. that's one of the temptations, just forging on. Uh, you know, it was like, um, who was it that said, Winston Churchill said, if it feels like hell, keep going. 
<laughs> you know, you know, just keep going and just keep going. And, um, and that's, that's what I did. And I think you, you, you end up getting through the tunnel and you can start to start to see the light at the end. And then even now, I mean, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent, I'm close, but, um, you know, I'm not a hundred percent, but I just keep that in mind. Uh, and lots of prayer. I mean, I had, to, like I said, with the spiritual director, lots of prayer and hope and almost having to kind of re-examine my own spiritual life. Um, mm-hmm. But we're body and soul. You know, it's not a, you know, there's no, there's not a spiritual answer to this. Right, it's, right. You know, Bishop, in, spiritual, in, my, rec- uh, in my rectory, uh, every twice a week in the basement, we have the AA people and the NA people. And uh, they always say the same thing that like, I only was able to get on the right road when I surrendered to my higher power. And I mentioned that because while you and I are professional religious in terms of talking to people about God, I don't find it any easier than most people to completely and totally trust and give it over to him. Uh, when, when you're an administrator as you are as a bishop, uh, I would tend to think that it's so easy to believe that human beings can fix everything ultimately or find a solution. Uh, how and when did you come to a point where you said, uh, I can't? But with you, all things are possible, Lord. Well, that that whole struggle that we all go through to surrender, to do his will, and to trust him with our lives, was there a particular time or is it a gradual thing where you were able to say, I'm there? Well, it was a gradual thing. Um, you know, it's one of those things we know and we were taught probably in the seminary. You know, we surrender, surrender our lives over to Jesus and to give him, you know, complete control. Um, but, you know, it, it, you can say those words, but to actually live them. And yeah. really, it was, and again, it goes back to my childhood. You know, my father was saying, you know, you can, you know, it, it, you feel like you, you know, part of it's your responsibility. And, and the Lord is saying, no, surrender everything. You know, I always loved that great prayer that's attributed to St. John the 23rd, when it was during the Second Vatican Council, where he, at night is supposed to have said, Lord, it's your church, I'm going to bed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and that's, and I told people that I, I would, I would counsel people to do that. And I wasn't taking the counsel myself. You know, I was taking things to home. I was taking things home. I was thinking, I was laying in bed, thinking about things and not living that total surrender. So I, I guess it was during the time I was away that I realized somebody gave me a little novena, the surrender prayer. It's a beautiful prayer. And um, just really living that complete surrender to God that we can do nothing without the strength and power of God and to believe that and live that um, it really is. It's, it's kind of scary because you're kind of giving up something, but that's what the Lord wants you to do. And he supplies more than you could possibly come up with yourself. Yeah. Bishop Jim Connolly's our guest. He's from Lincoln, Nebraska right now. Bishop, let me ask you the uh, other pressure every Bishop faces in recent years is how to manage the scandal, the hurt, the pain that comes from, priests who uh, did not do what they should. Interestingly, in my parish, for many, many years, a regular visitor to our parish had been Cardinal McCarrick because he's close to a family here. Uh, So I know that for that family and so many others who knew him, great heartbreak, great disappointment, great letdown. How, even though you and I know it's a, frankly, small minority of priests who have done the wrong thing, how do we help our people to come to trust again that the vast majority of priests are a good, faithful uh, love their kids and would never hurt a kid ever for any reason. Uh, have you found a, a way back for us? Well, that's a very important important topic because, um, you know, it was really kind of what led to kind of my, um, you know, taking a leave of absence because the McCarrick story had just broke that summer. Uh, and then the Pennsylvania grand jury mm-hmm. report came out. And then we had some local, and then our attorney general from our state asked all three dioceses for their files. Wow. So all that happened in about a, a, a space of about six weeks. And for me, it was um, being a convert to the Catholic faith, as you know. Yeah. Um, I, I, just, I, I, was, I, was, uh, I was disillusioned. I was saying, what is happening to our church? Yeah. And... Um, it wasn't until I, you know, kind of put it more in perspective that, uh, like you were saying, uh, without minimizing the the damage, the horror, the pain, the suffering that is caused has been caused by this relatively small number of priests, 
um, the church is still the church and the church is still the church that I fell in love with yeah. when I decided to become a Catholic when I was in college. And, you know, even though it's been shaken, um, it, uh, it's the same church, it's the same bride of Christ. And, um, and it's the same beautiful, good and true church. Um, it's just, that's the human side of it, you know, and, um, it, it was, especially as a Bishop, uh, it is, and it was um, devastating, you know, to to know uh, what's happened and to talk to victims and to see the damage that was done. Um, but you know what gives me hope, and um, I don't know if it's your your experience, but these young priests that are going in, you know, they're getting a lot better formation than we got, you know, mm. especially in the human area. And uh, these guys. Um, are really, I think their motives have been purified because they're entering the priesthood at a time when the priesthood is not held very high in society. So these guys are purely motivated by supernatural motives. You know, they're going, Mm -hmm. they're not going into it because they're going to be like a, you know, a doctor or a lawyer, you know, because oftentimes, you know, in the past, that's what, uh, that's where the priesthood was, was esteemed, how it was esteemed. But these guys are going into the priesthood during a time when, when the priesthood is kind of at a low. Yeah. Um, but they're so filled with zeal and joy, and they see that the church needs good priests now more than ever. Um, I remember when uh, talking to some seminarians when I was in Rome, and it was right after the Boston scandal happened. Mm. And they were, these guys were from Boston, and um, there were four of them. And I was talk, talking to them in front of St. Peter's, and I asked them, I said, gosh, it must be tough for you guys being seminarians in Boston these days. And one of them, just without hesitation, said, you know, he said, this is the best time to be a seminarian. The church needs good men now right. more than ever. Right, right. And I said, bravo. And that that uh, young man's a priest now, and I keep in contact with him. So, um, yeah, but it's 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 tough, but it's uh, there is hope, and there is a great encouragement with these young young seminarians and priests. Bishop Connolly, because you you mentioned it a few moments ago about the word coming back from the Holy Father that uh, you should take the time and take whatever time you need to get well again. I mentioned him because uh, very often on this program, I I don't have just Catholics. I have people of all faiths and some people who are uh, agnostic. uh, uh, We had Ed Asner, the actor on, and uh, I said, you you identify as a... uh, atheistic Jew. I said, but you're also 92. So I'm wondering, are you still an atheist? And he said, the older I get, the more I'm hoping you people are right, you know? And I I think (laughs) it's it's important to talk to people of all faiths. But I mentioned that because even those who have no faith uh, are drawn to and are are touched by what they see as a quality of uh, the heart in in Pope Francis. Uh, As a bishop serving in his time, uh, your impression of of our, our Holy Father? Well, I think he's brought forth uh, a lot of things, um, especially an understanding of humanity and uh, the frailness of of the human person. You know, his great love for the poor, obviously, but also one of the images that um, always sticks in my mind is there was a group of uh, people with disability that were at an audience, you know, and he came up and kissed this one a person who was obviously very, very um, much uh, disabled, deformed. But he's, I think, brought a great appreciation for the the human, the weakness of the the human person and how we must love that person uh, in a special way. But uh, I think that that, that's something that he's really given to me. Yeah, no, he has touched people in, in unique ways for just that reason. Bishop Jim Connolly is our guest, as I mentioned, from Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, Bishop, you mentioned earlier a quote from uh, John the 23rd, and I I, just, I believe that uh, St. John the 23rd is uh, is the heart of my own priestly vocation because I was growing up, he was the Pope. Uh, but his humanity was what ignited in me the notion of service to the church. When you come forward and you share the struggle, when you come forward and you share the steps you took to get back to wholeness again, when you share with people openly and honestly the fact that the fact that a person puts on a collar doesn't mean they're not struggling just like everybody else, I think you are helping so many people by your transparency. Uh, it's such a gift, such a grace 
that you're doing what you're doing, not only in, in grappling yourself, but then saying to the world, this is who I am, uh, imperfect, uh, God loves me just as I am, and I'm working to be better. I just think you free a lot of people out there who are listening to a program like this to say, we can't all do it alone. N none of us can carry ourselves. We need the help of, of God. We need the help of the therapists and the good people out there who can solve it. I, I hope you know, I think you do know, you're, you're a wonderful gift. You've always been a wonderful gift of the church, but in particular, this willingness to share brokenness and the road to healing is, is such a wonderful grace and goodness. And I, I just thank you for being on the show. And I thank you for, uh, for your testimony because more than you know, I think you, you have touched so many hearts and minds and will continue to. Thank you for that. Thank you, Muncie. I appreciate that. And I, if I can help anybody, I, wanna, I, wanna, I want to, uh, God to use me as an instrument of healing for anybody who, who goes through the same kind of suffering. Because I know a lot, of people, a lot of people do. So get help. That's all I can say is get help. Don't, don't isolate yourself. Reach out. Thank you, Bishop. As we end today's program, I want to thank you all for being with us. If you have any questions or comments about the show, you can send them to me at our Personally Speaking podcast. Uh, just write to personally speaking podcast at gmail.com. To listen to our personally speaking podcast with some of our most recent shows, please go on YouTube and search under Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jimmasanti. And don't forget to click the like and subscribe buttons. Personally Speaking is also available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, on iHeart, and on Spotify. You can also listen to past episodes by going on www.com closeencountertv.com that's all one word closeencountertv.com and clicking on the radio button at the top of the page additionally personally speaking episodes are also available on my parish website which is www.ollmp.org ollmp.org uh, and you'll hear not only our past shows but Monsignor Jim's weekly homilies uh, on the home page if you're able to financially help support the airing personally speaking and our radio ministry be deeply appreciated. Personally Speaking is also on Facebook at Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Santi. Please share and let others know about Personally Speaking. I also want to give a, a special word of thanks to those who have supported uh, our program over the years, uh, in particular the generous support of Peg and Pete D'Angelo. I'm privileged to serve as host and executive producer Personally Speaking. Our producer is Lisa Jandovitz. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be with you next time on Personally Speaking.